Dear colleagues, in this episode, Transalecrine and Approach to the Distal Humerus, in our course, Surgical Approaches to the Elbow, we will demonstrate techniques for alecrine and osteotomy. The landmarks are shown, the lateral epicondyle, the medial epicondyle, and the tip of the olecranon with the topography of the olecranon marked out. The most important relationship we have to be aware of is the relationship between the olecranon and the medial epicondyle with the ulnar nerve lying in its sulcus between the two. The incision we're going to demonstrate is the standard posterior or dorsal curvilinear incision going radial to the olecranon and coming down parallel to the crest of the ulna but not on it so that when it's healed the incision is not on the weight-bearing area of skin when the patient has their arm on a table. Here we have elevated skin flaps uh, laterally and medially and here we have deliberately kept the olecranon and bursa tissue with the skin to keep the skin strong elevating the bursa off the periosteum of the proximal ulna and elevated both flaps to their norm their natural reflection from the fascial attachment to the antibrachial fascia here and here where the blood vessels come through so we don't want to necessarily dissect more than that our two important features now are the anconeus lateral to the crest of the ulna attaching both to the ulna and the humerus in this long triangular region here and then the ulnar nerve on the medial side which we will find underneath the medial border of the triceps in this region here so our next point of dissection is for the nerve so that we know where that is going in behind the medial epicondyle into the fascial band between the epicondyle and the ulnar, the, the point of attachment of the flexor carpi ulnaris. So we will now go ahead and dissect the nerve and then demonstrate the anconeus to you. So here is an incision in the antibrachial fascia overlying anconeus. And here we see the fascia just elevated off the muscle a little way. The muscle is this beautiful triangular muscle which takes attachment from the humerus and ulna but also as you see here attaches all the way down the ulnar border of the proximal ulna here. Now we're not going to dissect more proximal than this because our osteotomy is going to be more or less at this level but we want to include the anconeus in the triceps because as we have previously said anconeus should be considered as part of the triceps in its functional relationship to elbow stability and elbow extension here we are peeling the anconeus sharply off its very strong fibers of attachment to the periosteum of the ulna and in this region we're going to elevate it completely from the capsule in order to do a capsulotomy before our osteotomy so that we are clear exactly where our osteotomy is going to enter the trochlear fossa of the proximal ulna here we are in the capsule of the olecranon 
and in here we will find the joint space. We'll return to that in a short while. Before that, we want to fully release the ulnar nerve so that we can mobilize the proximal tip of the olecranon when we flip it to expose the joint. So we now return to the dissection of the ulnar nerve. The nerve is found under the medial border of the triceps here. And a good safe trick to identifying and then elevating and freeing the nerve is to pass a pair of small iris scissors into the canal and then incise the roof of the canal, protecting the nerve from harm as we do so. Here we now divide the fibrous band or arcade between the two attachment points of flexor carpi ulnaris and now you see that muscle exposed through incision of the antibrachial fascia again and very gently we can part the muscle. The nerve supply to the muscle is parallel to the ulnar nerve and can often be seen as a separate nerve coming into flexor carpi ulnaris in this position here. And the vascularity of the ulnar nerve is well worthwhile noting. There is normally an axial vessel on its outer surface, but the vena nervorum are on the deep surface. In here you see those demonstrated. And these are as important for perfusion of the nerve. And so we try to preserve them as much as we can. So the nerve is free to move, but not free of its per perineurium, which is its vascular supply. This is important to avoid the risk of postoperative ulnar neuritis. We have now progressed the dissection to elevate the capsule from the medial side of the joint, having mobilized the ulnar nerve. And we have now identified the joint space medially and laterally. And Lars is demonstrating a nice trick to understand where is the deepest point of the olecranon fossa or the trochlear fossa of the proximal ulna in order to plan where the osteotomy should be. And we can mark that line with our vital skin marker across here. We then have options for our osteotomy. Our objective is to expose the distal humerus without unnecessary devascularization of important tissues, one of which is the anconeus muscle. As we have previously mentioned, this is an important muscle for elbow stability, and we want to preserve it in continuity with its nerve supply, which comes from proximal as a very long independent nerve coming down in this region together with its blood supply from proximal. So we have options in terms of how we cut the ulnar itself. We could perform an extra articular osteotomy, raising a medallion of bone including both the superficial aponeurotic layer and the deeper muscular layer of the triceps. But that would only give us access to perhaps one third of the distal humeral articular surface. And in a complex fracture, we would need more. The osteotomy, transalecranon osteotomies, will give us about two thirds of the articular surface remaining one-third anteriorly, still being very difficult to see. But we're now going to demonstrate a transalecranon osteotomy. And there are two ways of doing this in terms of how to cut the bone. One is apex distally. 
the other apex proximally. And we can show you on the sin bone which might be the more useful. If we orient the sin bone as we have here, you can see that there is a very strong cortical ridge here and a part of the ulna designed for compressive load in the metaphysis here with cancellous bone. We might say that cancellous bone would heal better than cancellous to cortical bone. So if our osteotomy was apex distal, although there is strong bone here, that healing might be not as advantageous as apex proximally. But we have to be very careful with the volume of bone that we have present. It is not necessarily the case that one is more advantageous than the other. But today we're going to plan and perform an apex proximal osteotomy to demonstrate this. And now we've incised the periosteum apex proximally so that the exit point of the osteotomy will be at the bare area of the olecranon laterally and medially and we note that it's very slightly asymmetric. Before proceeding we need to know how we're going to fix this osteotomy and there are various ways of doing that. What is commonly used is a standard olecranon plate in case of um, poor quality bone I wouldn't rely on just a plate but perhaps use some kind of osteo sutures mm -hmm. as well through the tendonous insertion and separate drill holes. Got you. More or less like the classic tension band that we've been taught previously. Yeah. Got you. Another way of fixing this is of course to use the classic so-called tension band um, principle. And the key here is to implant K-wires so that we can create a stable fixation close to the joint surface of the ulna whilst permitting an external band usually in the form of a figure of eight to apply compression on the lateral side. The angle at which one inserts these wires is very important and it's often very difficult to know what orientation they should be in. We have a landmark here, and that is the radial head. If we rotate the radial head in here, we know that that articulates medially with the coronoid of the ulna. And so the radial head gives us a clue as to where the coronoid process might be and our wires need to exit initially immediately ventral and anterior or distal to the coronoid process. In other words, we can pre-plan our wires in the correct orientation close to the articular surface to support it, but exiting in the anterior aspect or ventral aspect of the ulna distally. On this occasion, we're going to use a plate because this bone has sufficient quality that tension band wiring might not be necessary. Here we are performing the chevron osteotomy apex proximally. I want to simply emphasize that the depth of the bone is greatest in the center of the ulna, not at its margins, of course. So the angle of the, of the saw must be adjusted so as not to damage the distal humerus. So we gradually take the osteotomy and rotate this, the saw so that we're no longer cutting into the more shallow areas of bone either side.
and we do not go all the way through the bone with the saw at this level. As a safety precaution, you can uh, put a blunt instrument of some kind underneath and uh, protect from the saw cut. Perfect. And I'm just going to con continue with the, the, the lateral saw cut. And again, I'm going to rotate the saw so that we do not risk damaging the humerus at the depth of the cut. Just to that point, the rest of the osteotomy is performed using an osteotome. The idea behind this is that the cartilaginous surface close to the bare area will fracture according to its structure as opposed to something that I impact, impose on it with the saw. So we're just going to very gently keep going until we're very close to the articular surface and we then go back to the ulnar side and do the same thing. We're making sure that the ulnar nerve is away from harm. And we're listening for that change in tone and a slight gapping of the bone itself. Here you see the bone is beginning to gap and as we gently prise it apart, you hear the snap and that's the remaining bone fibers beginning to part company there. And what we're aiming for is a low energy, very controlled osteotomy, which is now held by periosteofascial peri tissue medially, free laterally, but in continuity with anconeus here. Now, we'll free it up on the medial side. Free up the capsule. And then we're going to elevate anconeus and begin to take it more proximally. But already we see a good exposure of the distal humerus. And we can now, without devascularizing the ulnar nerve, incise the capsule. And as mentioned previously, keep the bone protected by the fat pad, elevating the capsule from the olecranon and fossa. and reflecting the capsule medial from the lateral column here. And that flip allows us to maintain tissue continuity with the bone. The triceps has not been in any way taken off the olecranon itself, so that both its muscular part deeply and its ligamentous part more superficially remain attached to the olecranon. And we can now begin to dissect on the back of the lateral epicondyle to expose the capitellum and more distally the radial nerve. Beg your pardon, the radial head. Here is the capsule elevated from the sublime tubercle and the anconeus coming off more distally. Here on the lateral side, I've reflected the antibrachial fascia to demonstrate the anconeus, this lovely triangular muscle here. Remember, we elevated it sharply from periosteum distally, and now we can elevate it as a pedicled muscle because its blood supply and nerve supply come from proximal, elevating it off the deep extensor muscles of the forearm with the osteotomy and that then goes proximally to 
be in continuity with the triceps and our d further dissection is then on the lateral epicondylar crest elevating the entire muscle that is what we might call quadriceps brachii the long head lateral head, medial head, and anconeus head of the triceps. We're elevating the entire triceps muscle group, including the anconeus, which we might call the fourth head of the triceps. So we now have an excellent view of the lateral column and capitellum sufficient to fix a low transverse relatively simple fracture of the lateral column and when that is now replaced at the end of the procedure when we allow the triceps back into its normal position our our reconstruction is of the antibrachial fascia which restores continuity and therefore stability to the joint on the lateral column. We would like to show you the very clean edge of the cut of the osteotomy on its external surface and compare that with the articular surface where there is a, an edge which is able to interdigitate with the remainder of the olecranon so that the articular reduction is helped by this irregularity. A planar osteotomy could slide whereas this relative irregularity would interdigitate and enable us to create a stable fixation. And of course, the reconstructed distal humerus gives us the template for that reconstruction. Because every saw blade has a thickness, the external osteotomy wound is likely not to fit perfectly but the deep part on the chondral surface is now interdigitated and we can now fix that as we discussed earlier with either a plate or wires or a suture technique and in some cases an intramedullary screw technique but we favor the plate technique for its stability. So in summary, we would like to point out that deciding to do an osteotomy is directly related to the diagnosis and your intended management of a distal humeral articular fracture. How we do the osteotomy is dependent more on the patient's bone quality than on a particular philosophical concept. The critical steps include identifying anconeus as a part of triceps and elevating it with the triceps and identifying the ulnar nerve, freeing it sufficiently to gain access to and then perform capsulotomy on the medial side of the joint. And then identifying the bare area using the technique that Lars demonstrated with two blunt objects, in this case scissors, to identify the depth of the trochlea of the ulna. With all those in mind, it is possible to perform a very adequate exposure of the distal humerus using olecranon osteotomy, providing one plans that as carefully as one does the articular fixation itself.